Good afternoon folks, uh, my name is Tom Miles. What I'm going to talk to you today about is the lovely shiny Nikon D850, uh, which, full disclosure, uh, I worked on the launch event for. I obviously, I own and use one. Um, this is going to be a bit of a loving. Uh, this isn't going to be what you'd call an objective look at the D850. This is going to be you know, all about how amazing it is. If you're hoping for negativity, go elsewhere. But in a broader sense, what I really want to talk about is actually what we use our cameras for, what roles our cameras play, and what, what makes a camera professional, what makes tools professional rather than just throw away amateur stuff. Now I'm very, very lucky in my job. Uh, I get to shoot a huge variety of stuff. Uh, I can be working in a studio with a great deal of control and lots and lots of lights and, and a great deal of precision and lots of time to carefully build a shot. I can be doing very, very high speed action stuff. I can be underwater photographing world's strongest man. And I can be doing very fast moving, very reportage kind of work. So I, I cover within my sort of genre of sports and portraits, I cover quite a wide range of approaches. Now, for obvious reasons, those approaches have different requirements. And I, even though I'm a professional, don't have the funds for a specific tool for every single job I shoot. Okay? Just as importantly, I wouldn't want a specific tool for every single job I shoot. Um, some of you might be looking at those images top right and thinking, oh, I wish I had all that much kit, I wish I had all those toys. And yeah, you know, confession, sometimes it is nice doing a shoot with the proverbial kitchen sink and just throwing everything at it. I've got an assistant and a crew and half a dozen lights. And it's great, but all of that kit has to be transported, has to be set up, has to be broken down. That all of that kit has to be maintained. I have to make sure it's all still working. It also has to all be insured, okay? And if there was some magical way that I could get away with sort of just one camera and not need other stuff, I'd take it like a shot. And if there was some way I could get away without needing loads and loads of flashes and stands and all the rest, that'd be even better. But I think that really is a pipe dream. Right, philosophical, let's, let's step back. What I want to think about is what role cameras play and how they've changed and evolved over the years. What you see here is every camera I have used seriously since I started earning money out of photography back in 1993. Uh, that is me in 1993. Um, I always wore my top buttons on up because I genuinely thought it made me look more attractive. Um, I was very fond of those cords, but otherwise that's not really a photo to be terribly proud of. You recognise that Pentax P30, my first camera, and then in my hand a Canon F1 from the local paper I was working on, that's held together with packing tape, okay, because it had seen a lot of use. So that's all the stuff I've used over the years in various forms, all the ones I've used seriously, I've not included, you know, Instamatics and amateur bits and pieces. What I want us to think about is just try and take a bigger picture I think about how all those different cameras serve different purposes. You know, way back in the day when there was film, probably the most common ones you saw were obviously 35mm SLRs. They were very, very widespread. They, of course, could do quite a wide variety of stuff. You know, they were capable of doing you know, landscapes, wildlife, action, all sorts of bits and pieces. They were fairly small, fairly portable. They're very versatile. You, know, you could also have a wide range of lenses and motor winds and underwater housings, all sorts of things. The catch was, if you ever used to use them, that unless you were shooting under incredibly controlled circumstances, using very, very fine-grained film and taking great care throughout the whole process, 35mm camera couldn't produce really, really high-quality images. You know, you're always up against the fact that the neg was only this big. Then, of course, one step up from that, you had medium format in all its various different permutations. Uh, I was very familiar with using my big old Mir RB, and, of course, the difference here was you obviously get more quality. You had, you had a larger negative, and that made for bigger prints and better quality images. And they were still fairly usable. You know, you had sort of a viewfinder, and they were fairly okay to use. But, of course, they were a big step down from 35mm in terms of how portable, how versatile they were. Um, I mean, I remember shooting handheld with my RB quite a bit, and it's not a pleasant experience. It weighs a tonne. The viewfinder's reversed, so as you go that way, they're going that way. It takes some getting used to. And of course, at the end of the scale, you have large format. I have extensive experience in large format. I probably, although I've never proved this, hold the world record for most 10 by 8 inch Polaroids processed in one day, which was 287 for those who'd like to try and look it up. Uh, very, very expensive day shooting. Large format, of course, gave you the ultimate in quality. You know, absolutely enormous negatives or slides, 
but the trade-off, as those of you who've used it would know, is they really don't suit anything but situations where you are completely under control of what is happening. You, know, you could not shoot a live event with a large format camera. It takes, you know, if at your fastest, takes about 20 seconds between frames as you open and close and reload and move. Very, very hard to use, but amazing quality. And then, of course, along comes digital. Um, looking around, I can see different ages, but of course I've no idea about different experiences. Hands up, who remembers the days when six megapixels was high resolution? Oh, good. Oh, excellent. Oh, that's encouraging. I thought it was nothing but millennials. Wonderful. Six megapixels was high resolution, and we used things like microdrives, okay? And one gig was mind-blowingly high. And when digital came in, the problems that the engineers and the designers now face were, broadly speaking, twofold. It was how many pixels can you ram on the sensor, and then how quickly can you get that data off the sensor, through the camera, onto the memory card, and out to your computer. And what happened quite early on, from sort of the early 2000s, was that very rapidly you developed specific cameras that did specific jobs. Generally speaking, along the lines of higher resolution but slower to operate, and lower or medium resolution but faster to operate. And you had two distinct streams of ways cameras operated. That's also how I worked. In fact, for the past 14, 15 years, that's how I've worked. I always have two bodies as a professional. I have you know, a backup and I often shoot with both, not exactly at the same time, but on the same job. And one of them will be lower or medium resolution but very fast, and the other will be higher resolution but slower. You can probably guess where this is going, can't you, boys and girls? Um, this is the evolution of it. This is, this is both of them in one thing, okay? Now, before we dive into the full-on loving evangelical bit, what I want to recap, remember, is that cameras are just tools, okay? Cameras are there, particularly as a professional, to enable, to let me do things. They're not supposed to cause me to have to make difficult choices. Okay, I, I don't want to be in a position where I'm commissioned to go and do a job and I have to sit there agonising for quite a while about which is the right tool for this job. You know, this, this tool might be nearly right, but uh, if that's... And this, uh, that's not something I want to do. And even worse, I do not want to get onto a job and realise I have the wrong tool because the nature of the job changes. The other thing that I'm quite obsessed with um, is there's lots of like, headline spec. You know, we, we all love to read reviews and you know, that, you know, what makes the headlines is the frame rate and the resolution. But as a professional, those things are not as important as you think. Lots of stuff that matters to me is the slightly more under the hood esoteric stuff like how it handles, what the build quality is like, how fast it responds, how much you can customize it, okay? When all that works well, you end up with a tool that literally handles pretty much anything. And it means not having to make those difficult choices. It means not having to sit there in the pre-production stage of a job and think, this or this, or do I hire one? And of course, I certainly don't end up on a job thinking, oops, I brought the wrong bit. So let's start with the, the big headline feature, the resolution of it. Um, I suspect lots of you probably know the specs. The 850's got 45.7 megapixels. Um, amazing. Now, I'm gonna stick my neck out here and say that bigger is not always better, believe it or not. Some of you may know that if you look at really, really big images, they actually don't need to have quite as much data on them as you might think. Okay, There's, I'm not going to go into the maths because people would get quite bored, and also I don't know the maths. But the larger something is printed, for example, a, a massive 48-sheet billboard that you see on the, on the roadside, you'd think, oh my god, that's you know, hugely detailed. But if you walk up really, really close, you'll see the big printing dot is made up of because of course to see all of it you have to stand far enough back that you can't scrutinize the detail it's when you think about it it's common sense and there's an old rule of thumb in professional circles that actually the most demanding use you can put an image to is a double page spread in a magazine the logic being that this is the biggest you have something whilst you're also close to it to enable you to scrutinize the detail now going back away, uh, I was shooting double page spreads in magazines with a six megapixel camera, and they were absolutely fine. So why would you want more resolution? You know, more resolution means everything slows down, you use your storage up quicker, it's slower to process, it's slower to send to people. Why on earth would you bother making a camera with more than six million pixels in it in that case? Well, you probably know why. Uh, obviously, more resolution does let you make bigger and higher quality images. That's, that's a given, okay? We pretty much all grasp that. 
what you might not be as appreciative of is that as a professional, my images are used. Okay? Obviously when I shoot personal work I can do what I like, but when I'm being commissioned, I am being commissioned to shoot something for a specific purpose. So I'm being told they need a, a sidebar for the website, or a double page spread, or a cover, or a web banner. Okay? And when I shoot them, I've got that in mind. You know, I compose the images a certain way. Double page spreads, for example, you don't put anything important in the middle, because they'll disappear into the fold. You know, somebody's face will just in the fold of the magazine. Likewise with a cover, you make sure you leave a bit of space around the top. And where resolution kicks in is that sometimes, despite how professional and how careful I may be, I don't get exactly the shot I wanted exactly the way I wanted. Okay? Um, Mr. Rory up there, top right, who I've worked with quite a few times, lovely, lovely chap, but whenever I work with him, even though it's all official, I have minutes literally minutes, sometimes even seconds, to get God knows how many different things, to get different cover options, portrait features, etc, etc, etc. And it might be that the perfect frame of him in terms of his expression, where he's looking, was actually one that I shot for an interior double page spread as landscape format. And of course if I've got whacking great chunks of resolution, well the art director can just go and wipe off half the frame and there's still a perfectly usable cover. Okay, so that extra resolution is incredibly useful if I know my images are going to get used. I mean, look at some of those, and they don't all fit the standard 24 by 36 frame format, do they? Okay, they've been chopped about quite a lot and been played with. Here's some actual sort of, well, non-commissioned versions, if you like. Um, what I've done here, these are both fairly recent shoots. What you can play around with are 45 megapixels. Top left is, well, it's not actually straight out the camera, it's been in Photoshop, but that's the resolution straight out the camera. And then from that, I've pulled up a headshot. Now you're probably glancing at that and thinking, three megapixels, that's useless. Well, stop a minute, remember about images being used, where are most headshots used? Online, okay? How much resolution do you need for that? About 300 by 300, <laughs> or 500 by 500. Yeah, if, if you send in a headshot to an online thing that's 45 megapixels, it'll just bounce back. It's like, not interested. So if you're able to take the whole frame where you've caught that perfect expression and you're able to pull a headshot out from it, well, that's quite handy. And here, from that same shot, is exactly what I was just talking about. Let's say they wanted a cover, but the cover versions I shot, I just didn't quite capture her expression right, or she just wasn't in the mood, or something changed. But because I got everything perfect in a landscape version, they can still hack a chunk of it, and they've still got 24 megapixels to play with. I've shot uh, 150-something magazine covers, mostly with 8, 12, 16 megapixels. 24 will definitely do a cover, I can assure you. <laughs> More than enough resolution to play with. And down here, I mean, I shot it like this, that's how I wanted it. I wanted small figure in big landscape, okay, that's what I was going for. But I can very easily take a really wide format panorama, and it's still going to be 28 megapixels. Okay, it's still a lot to play with, and even, I mean, 10 is probably verging on the, I might not want to put on the cover, but I've still got almost a cover format image there, just from that really wide cropped image. So having that extra resolution, very, very useful tool indeed when you're working out. I am now going to contradict myself, okay? Keep following me, please. Um, like most professionals, I shoot raw, okay, because I want you know the best quality I can get off the sensor. I put up with the sort of the slight slowdown in workflow because it's just better quality. Now, of course, in the olden days, if you shot raw, you could only shoot at full resolution. That's how cameras were set. You know, a handful of cameras let you use small raw, but it would be sort of three megapixels, which wasn't that versatile. And the truth is, despite what I've just said about using and cropping into things. Some of the jobs I shoot, not many, but some of the jobs, actually don't need that much resolution, and in fact, speed is more important. There are times when I'm shooting and the client needs stuff immediately. Okay, now of course, I could just shoot JPEG and spit them out, but I don't really like doing that. Uh, obviously, the more resolution, the slower every part of the workflow is. And the 850 has got three RAW modes, okay? You still get the full RAW quality, you're still using the full sensor, but it just sort of does something clever with the pixels. Don't ask me, I'm not an engineer. Uh, and it will shoot at 25 point something in medium raw mode. Now, of course, that is still very, very usable, but it will speed up the whole workflow process. This was for a corporate client, uh, end of January, I think. And all it was, was straightforward sort of corporate portraits, okay, down in their offices. It's only ever going to be online, okay, that's a guarantee. It's never going to end up as, you know, massive great posters. 
the client is there all day watching me do it. They want to see it coming up on the laptop straight away, and my laptop is knocking on a bit. Uh, if I shoot tether into my laptop at 45 megapixels, you do need to um, go and make a cup of tea whilst it renders everything. Uh, but at 25, it'll carry on at a decent speed. And of course, if they should change their minds, 25 is actually, again, pretty usable. It's still going to be okay if they did want to print them big. Speed. Speed, 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 speed. Absolutely critical factor for me, not just because I shoot lots of sports and action stuff, but just generally, okay? Lots of you might know the specs. It'll go at seven frames a second basic and nine frames a second if you took a, stick a battery grip up its bottom. Um, I haven't even bought the grip yet. I'll, I'm sure I'll get around to that at some point. Now, of course, you also probably know that a high frame rate is great because if you're photographing action, it just gives you a wider safety net. So you can keep blasting away until you get that one moment of peak action. It's not cheating, promise, um, but it does increase your chances of getting that moment that really, really matters. Uh, there, there were more shots in this sequence, but I just nine made a nicer layout. Besides just the frame rate and how fast it goes, speed really matters in a couple of other areas. Autofocus is one of them, and hand on heart, even though I'm well aware there are official Nikon people with an earshot who can hear me and you, know, you might think I'm watching over my shoulder. I've never used anything faster apart from when I borrowed a D5. It is just razor sharp and it's so consistent and it just tracks everything. For somebody who's been shooting as long as I have, it, it's quite unsettling. It's so locked on when it tracks people. And if you do the video bit where it now tracks faces, uh, I'm quite fine. It's like being in Terminator 2 because you bring up and the faces, it just follows their focus. I, yeah, they're gonna take over soon, might worry. Um, but where it really matters is just how the whole thing handles. Uh, you know, as, as short a shutter lag as possible. You know, the delay between doing that and it actually taking a picture, that really matters. How quickly the menus appear, how quickly the playback appears, how quickly it writes stuff out to the card. All of these really, really matter. Uh, I remember too painfully the early days and the D100, and I think it did three frames a second, six megapixels. But what they didn't really talk about was it would only do nine frames before it sat and had a good long think about it. Okay, because the buffer just filled up and, uh, and of course, you know, if you're shooting something in a studio, it's not the end of the world. But if a live event is happening in front of you, that's a problem, okay? The other thing is it's, it's worth getting, uh, worth, worth spending money, should we say, don't often say this, on decent cards. Uh, this is one of those areas that really is a false economy. I was definitely in the cynical camp when XQD came along with my D4. I thought, oh goody, another memory card format, whoop de doo you know, yet another card reader, yet another workflow. And in fact, the early ones I thought were a bit rubbish. There was no obvious advantage. Um, I can tell you hand on heart that if you use something like an 850, which has got to push a staggering amount of information through itself, get the most expensive card you can. Otherwise you're missing out on lots of its performance. Um, I, I'm not taking any money from that, by the way. I just recommend you don't get frustrated watch, waiting for these lights to go out. So we've got high res and high speed. That's the headline bit, okay? so. Let's get a bit more general and even more evangelical about why it's such a useful tool for me. Now, as you saw in the early picture, I have been shooting for a while, and I shoot quite a wide, ra you know, wide range of stuff. You can see stuff where I'm covered in crap and clambering over obstacles and wearing busy vests through to quite complicated. That's, that's one part of a multi-part shot where there's going to be a martial artist and some powder and all sorts of things, a whole day to create one image. So, as I say, I'm covering a wide variety of stuff. Now, apart from those early days shooting with my Pentaxes back in the film days and my Mamiya and things, and a very brief period when I shot with cameras that had a red thing around the front of the lens, I remember them very well, um, I've been using Nikons the whole time. Now, part of that is not just spec, it's actually about how they're designed and how they function. Um, I've always liked the fact that when you pick a Nikon up, it feels like a photographer designed it. You know, things are where they're supposed to be. Uh, lots of other cameras I often find were designed by software engineers and they were just trying to find somewhere to put the buttons and randomly hide things beneath things. So no offence to any software engineers in the room, but you know, I prefer photographers design cameras. And what's great about the Nikons, but also the 850 particularly, is like I say, everything is where it ought to be. I don't have to go rummaging through 19 different button press combinations to get to something I want. And that, when you're working quickly, is vital. Lovely little touches like the little joystick that is left over from the D4 and the D5 that sits right under my thumb and lets me do half a dozen different things. Really, really handy. The bit that's also so useful, and this has sort of crept up on us quite stealthily over the past few years, is how much I can customise it. Now, I don't know how many people take advantage of this in their cameras, but you really, really should. It's easy to forget that only a few years ago, 
each button on the camera did just one job. That's what it did. You couldn't reassign things, couldn't move things around. And the menu options were usually limited to, do you want to format the card, yes or no? Okay, that was what you could do. Of course, nowadays, and you know, the 850 being one of the latest iterations of that, you can customize it to an enormous degree. And if you don't already, you really, really should look into this. You know, go and actually read your manuals. I know, weird idea. Uh, or go on YouTube videos and actually look at what you can do with it because you'll be able to create your camera that does exactly what you want and have it working exactly the way you want it to. And if you're really clever, and like me, you shoot a couple of different types of things, you can even set up two or even three main setups and just switch between them with a flick of a switch. I have all sorts of things. If I have, I have menu settings right under one button, so straight away I can get to a couple of the menus instantly. I have a setting so I can use a remote trigger on my video rig that stops and starts recording. That's really, really handy. I have back button auto focus. I have all sorts of things sort of set up on shortcuts. And besides making my life easier and smoothing out the job and smoothing out any bumps, it's also great fun when you're on shoots and somebody's like, oh, can I have a go with your camera? Yeah, help yourself. Because they can't operate it. <laughs> they literally can't make it work, which is quite satisfying in a cynical way. Build quality. Now, build quality is something that, if you read it in an online review, it's just a random esoteric word. Okay? It doesn't really mean anything until you actually go and handle something. As a professional, it really, really is quite important to me. Um, now, I'm not stupid, I'm not cavalier, I, I'm not a complete cowboy, but my stuff needs to take knocks. And the 850 is pretty robust and pretty solid. Uh, I have a lot of jobs where I'm on foot all day, I have a lot of jobs where I'm outside, climbing up things, you saw me on top of a wall covered in visi vests, I'm hanging out the back of 4x4s, God knows what, and my gear not only has to tolerate sort of wet weather and things, but it also has to tolerate repeated bangings against things and banging off stuff. Uh, quick tip, by the way, don't ever buy anything on eBay that you think might be ex-professional, okay? Because we do tend to kill our equipment stone dead. If you're suspicious, don't bid on it. Um, this was for a recent promo for an obstacle course race. Uh, we had the England Rugby World Cup team for a few years back playing in these obstacles. And obviously, it's, you know, it, was, it was late January. It wasn't nice out there. First thing in the morning, we are wrecking the location myself and the video crew and the client and the animal handler and the wolves. Those are wolves. Um, and we're wrecking the location. Okay, they're going to come through here. We'll shoot here. And out of the blue, well, not blue, it was quite grey. Uh, out of the grey came one of those absolute textbook, biblical stair rod downpours. You know, from naught to 60 in no time at all. Almost painful in terms of, I mean, you can see sort of you know, how white the background is and how much that rain is smashing down. And I carried on shooting. You know, I do have proper bespoke sort of think tank waterproof covers, but of course they take a while to put on. <laughs> and once they're on, they're staying on. They don't, they're switching easily. The video crew had run for cover already, and I'm just la 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 la. You know, I went and dried the camera off, and I took care, but it took it. It didn't just you know, decide, oh no thank you, and stop working completely. That sort of thing is something I really need to rely on. I don't like to go out on a job thinking, eh, will this keep working? Will I have to hold it under a towel the whole time? I just want to get on and shoot. Silent shooting. Now this is one of those qualities that you could classify as I didn't know I needed it until I needed it kind of thing. Um, I've used quiet mode on various cameras over the years. And, you know, some of you might have played with it because it exists in all sorts of different forms. And all it really does is sort of slightly dampen the noise of the mirror. You, know, you can very much definitely still hear the shutter going. Now I don't do weddings, I don't do wildlife, which is two areas where it's very obvious you would want to be completely silent, but there are lots of times when not making any noise is very, very handy. And then what the 850 will do is you bring up live view and you can shoot at, let me get the spec right, uh, six frames a second at full resolution, so 45 megapixels for quite a few frames, totally silently. And if you want just sheer speed, you can go at 30 frames a second, but you only get six megapixels and it's JPEG only, but of course it is basically faster than video. What it lets me do is it lets me do things like talking heads during interviews. Now, lots and lots of times I'm asked to do portraits of people and they're often being interviewed for the magazine at the same time. And of course I get time with them and we set a portrait up, but it's a really useful extra thing to shoot a talking head because they can drop them into the layout and often the person's quite natural and it's got quite a nice reportage feel to it. The catch is if the you know, person is sitting here, journalist is sitting opposite them with their dictaphone and I'm just here and I'm going click, 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 click. The person becomes very aware of that <laughs> and start to react to it. Plus the journalist isn't too happy that on their recording is this click, click, click noise all the time. 
So being able to shoot silently is fantastic because, of course, very quickly the person forgets that you're taking the picture and you get a much more natural response. And in the same vein, doing some favours my girlfriend who's a teacher, the kids know I'm in the classroom, OK? Uh, yeah, there's a, they're aware there's a man over there with a large camera, but because I'm able to sort of hold it down here and view the screen like this and shoot silently in no time at all, they forget I'm there and they just carry on doing what they're doing and of course you get much more natural shots. And lastly, which I have lots of call to use, I frequently work alongside video and film crews. And I guarantee you if there's one way to get yourself thrown off set very quickly, <laughs> it is to make loud clicking noises when they're running sound on a take. Okay, you can see the boom operator over there like that. Even from back there, if I was clicking, he'd have heard me absolutely without fail on the soundtrack. And yeah, they can take it out, but they'd rather not. <laughs> okay, so switch to silent mode, happy days. They'll be very, very pleased with that indeed. Speaking of video, like lots of professionals, I shoot quite a lot of video nowadays, it's kind of expected. And curiously, again, some of the headline specs are not what you might think I got excited about. The fact it shoots 4K, yeah, it's great, but it's actually not that big a, a pull for me. I don't quite see the advantage yet, and I know you've got extra resolution and you can crop in a little bit, but 4K is not really what I'm bothered about. I'm bothered about the fact that it'll shoot slow-mo. That's lovely, that's really, really handy. But above all, I'm bothered about what they've put into making the video more functional, okay? For the nth time today, put your minds back. About a decade ago, when video first appeared in DSLRs, and of course it was a huge leap forward in terms of how the images looked. You know, you had this massive sensor, which compared to consumer level video cameras was just enormous. You know, from a, from a small package that was fairly affordable, you were getting the same look and feel as ex really expensive pro level video stuff or even cine cameras. But it was in this much smaller, more affordable package. The drawback was, as any of you who have shot video at DSLRs knows, is that the form factor of DSLRs is not inclined to shoot video. <laughs> You have to, if you want to do anything other than just sort of leave it on a tripod and walk away, you end up with all of this sort of stuff, and you really, really have to pay attention to your workflow. And this is where the 850 has just been fantastic, because somebody has sat down and thought, OK, how would you actually use this when you're shooting video? So besides all the spec and the speeds it will do, resolutions, etc., it's been so well thought out. You've got really useful features like focus peaking, like you have on really pro you know, video cameras, so you can just tell it's in focus just from the red outlines on things. You've got highlight peaking as well. You've also got a really quick, clever way of setting white balance custom to where you're shooting, which is really, really handy. And everything is just conveniently packaged and there under this touch screen menu and you know, almost immediately to hand rather than buried in countless different menus. And like I say, I've also got a little system where I, I have the release trigger on my thumb there and on my rig as I'm moving around. All of that can be customized and all of it lets me do my job easier. So, Summing up this little historical ramble and, and camera loving, think back to what I, I think is my, my main point, my main principle. It's that cameras are our tools. We don't want to make excuses for them. Okay? The camera is supposed to serve us, enable us, you know, let us, let us do things, not force us to make choices and think this one or that one, oh, what do I need for this job? As a professional, I generally pay more for everything. You know, the obvious stuff like cameras and lenses, but also flashes, stands, lights, all these sort of bits and pieces. And besides the higher spec that I'm paying for, I'm usually paying for versatility and reliability. Okay? And the 850 yeah, has got that in spades, without reservation. Last little thought exercise for you. When we think about lots of the characteristics I've been talking about, about the build quality, the speed and whatever, it's very easy to actually take lots of that for granted, you know, because all these changes happen incrementally. We forget that not that long ago, you know, the things in our pockets that now will, you know, surf the internet for us and have got 20 million pixel cameras in them, they just called and sent text messages. And the same with cameras, you know, we, we used to get excited about a tiny increase in resolution. Now they do this amazing range of stuff. So it's easy to look at lots of these characteristics like how fast and how robust and whatever and take it for granted. But do a little thought experiment for me. Flip some of those characteristics around. Imagine if instead the 850 or, or your SLR was 20 centimeters bigger, it weighed another kilo, and only went at three frames a second. Or it went at you know, five frames a second, but you had to wait a minute for the buffer to clear. Okay? Or it was so delicately built that if you so much as got a drop of water on it, game over. 
Okay? Imagine what that would do to how you had to shoot and what choices you would have to make. And suddenly you realise, oh yeah, <laughs> this new stuff's really, really good, isn't it? For example, I, the current, the, my current setup is a D4 uh, 800 that now lives permanently in a video rig and my 850. When my D4 dies, again, don't buy stuff on eBay from a pro, when it dies, it will be dead. Uh, I won't get a D5. I, I love it, I've used it a few times. I'll get another 850 because you know, the advances in what it's done are so huge and it's such an incredibly versatile camera in a small package that it's the obvious choice. It's basically a tool that will let you shoot everything like this and much more besides. So I suspect it's going to be sitting in my camera bag for quite a long time to come. Uh, I'll take any questions afterwards if that's right, but thank you very much. Hope that was informative, guys.